Today's Advocate is a special edition in which you could say we are reaching above and beyond through the virtual window to get those quality conversations you have become accustomed to. Today's panelists need little or no introduction, but it would be rude of me not to at least say something, if only to whet your appetite. I'll be igniting the fire by asking, by way of a challenge or even a provocation, who says history will not repeat itself? Bright Jaja is clearly provoked by the gap between rich and poor. In fact, he says he's never understood it. He's saying without being dramatic that the future of the world hangs in the balance. Then it's Nafisa's turn, Nafisa Atiku that is. She's stating without equivocation that one way or the other, restructuring is our destiny. She only advocates that it be a peaceful way. I agree with you. Nafisa We'll hand over the torch to Rugged Man, a.k.a. Rugged Ibaba, who needs no jump starting as he'll be hitting the ground running with his advocacy on our immoral immunity clause. Jejo Mojua was probably born for this. He wastes no time in tabling his advocacy that the idea that Nigeria is oil rich is merely a myth. Some might say we've saved the best till last. I say you'll be spoiled for choice in that regard. Judge for yourselves as we kick off on this first lap of our special edition after the break, you're watching The Advocate on PLOS TV Africa, Strap Up. Recycling is only productive when dealing in valuable commodities. I'm going to be saying, who says history will not repeat itself? Everyone is talking about turning over a new leaf and pressing the reset button as though it were an automatic, even inevitable process. It's as if COVID-19 came with the DNA to usher in change. Yet, much as we speak of new beginnings, it must be apparent to us, even in our subconscious, that we're going nowhere and may even find ourselves back where we started or worse, on the other side of the storm. We complain of a corrupt government and systems that are hostile to transparency. We dream of a revolution but are loath to utter it in our waking moments. If we're sincere with ourselves, we would at least admit that our leadership are but a reflection of ourselves, with the benefit of a few years of power and influence. They connect less empathic, more defensive versions of ourselves, but ourselves nonetheless. We're so preoccupied with craning our necks to see a time beyond the virus that threatens us from without, that we neglect the virus within. Who says history will not repeat itself when we individually behave like a people allergic to criticism and correction? We prefer the shadows to the light of transparency and accountability. We cling to power, not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. We need to begin interrogating the systems of governance within our personal lives, our homes, our workplaces, and our spaces of interaction. To turn a new leaf in the annals of time, we must challenge ourselves even to the point of embarrassment. Forget how we look to others. For if we do not see a transformation in ourselves, we cannot hope for one in our nation. I know it sounds cliched, but change really does begin with you and I. Walking into a supermarket recently, I was impressed with how compliant everyone was with the social, social distancing protocols. Masks on, gloves, even a two meter distance observed in queues. I almost pinched myself. Could this be my beloved nation? And so we're capable of behaving in a disciplined way after all. Nigeria can write a new, more inspirational chapter in her history. She must. It's time to press release on the repeat button at long last after so many years. What do you say, guys? Well, that was an interesting piece, Eken. I thank you so much, and I so agree with you. You know, this pandemic has, you know, brought us Nigerians to a stage where we, where we have to acknowledge that things cannot just continue the same way that they have been. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see people. Actually, you're right, going into a supermarket and seeing people keep, <laughs> keep the distance. If somebody just coughs, you know, even as far as like two meters away, everybody's like, oh, no, 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 is, she wearing, is he or she wearing a first face mask? Are we keeping safe? And a whole lot of different things. It's really interesting to see how you know, in this mind, in our minds, we have this mindset that Nigerians can't change. Things just have to be the same way they are. But it's interesting to see how a pandemic is making us question our current, um, how do I put it, system and change for the better mm -hmm. and adjust, evolve. After all, we're human beings. We have to evolve to survive. Yeah. I know I had this conversation. Think, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I, I think for me, it's just, uh, I'm just, I've just been wondering you know, how the change 
was so rapid, you know. Um, it took a pandemic for us to get to a point where we can be all together at the same time there to act. But I feel like we've actually been in the pandemic for like the rest of our life <laughs> in Nigeria. <laughs> it's probably not COVID-19, but it's co corruption. Yeah. Right? Corruption and every other yeah. thing that has been here. But like the fact that we have not reacted, I mean, we've, we've seen worse things, like I said, corruption. The fact that we've not reacted you know, this way towards other things, just really, like, it's what I don't understand why this was so important that everybody is doing the same. Like, but the fact that the government can lock down the system and all that, imagine they do the same thing and follow the same processes with other issues that we're having. Nigeria will be probably one of the greatest countries in the world. Yeah. So I feel like we should not just stop here. We should find a way to apply the same structure into our, you know, political everyday system life. and every other thing. Okay, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Omodra, I don't know, are you seeing the same discipline? I know you're not. I, I, yeah. I don't think we're doing, I don't think Nigerians are actually, I don't think anything has fundamentally changed. Okay. I think we are speaking from our point of bias in terms of what we see people do, especially people around us that, that yeah. are not affected by the availability bias that is affecting most Nigerians and actually most people around the world. Mm -hmm. A lot more people do not care for COVID-19 and whether anybody's going to get killed because they don't have a sense of risk or threat with respect to the virus. And the reason is because of availability by us. They don't know anyone who's been affected personally. They don't know anyone who's been killed personally. Mm -hmm. And I don't just speak for Nigerians, I speak for everyone around the world. So we have about 4 million people affected globally. That's a lot mm -hmm. of number. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the fact that there are 7.6 billion people around the world, it also then means that most people around the world actually don't know people that, are pers that were personally infected or dead. So by and large, we are still really very, very irresponsible as to what we need to do. I know there is a perception that people are actually, you know, we, we've had, we've seen skits, people, somebody calls and everybody runs and everybody disappears. But just take a look around, actually. People are still badly behaved with respect to their reaction to the virus. Actually, interestingly and, enough, I wasn't necessarily saying that the change was pervasive. I was just saying that that gave me hope. The fact that we could even do it on any small scale gave me hope that we yeah. still had it in us to behave I wish correctly. I, could see, I wish I could see hope like you do. Um, okay. I don't. Maybe because I live in a country that has lost about 30, over 30,000 people already. Okay. And this is one of the most advanced countries of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Also, you look at America, they've lost over 70,000 people. Two countries lost 100,000 people to something that never existed, say, seven months ago. Something that did not kill a single person in these countries. Okay, I think we're, we're looking at the whole year, from just, different perspectives. Six months of the year. Yeah, so I have bigger fears than most people because I live right inside it. Yeah, you're looking at the mm -hmm. hope uh, from the point of view of the COVID-19 and overcoming the pandemic. I'm looking at the hope. As in, when the dust settles, will we, as a mm. people in Nigeria, have fundamentally changed? So I'm looking beyond that, so. and I'm saying Nigerians in terms of our discipline. Nigerians have never reacted to crises as an opportunity. We are the country where a major accident happens on, say, an Otedola bridge. In a, in a normal country, that would spot the carriage of inflammables. That would spot the, the new laws as to how you can move things like that around. We are not that kind of country. If Grenfell Tower had happened in Nigeria, Nothing would have happened to, the, to, to, to codes on building and how to build and uh, safety issues and the likes. I, I said, and I said all over again, Nigeria is not the only country that tragedies happen. The primary difference between Nigeria and most other serious countries is that they learn from the tragedies, so they don't get to suffer from the same things that cause that tragedy. So they experience new tragedies, not the same fire incident, not the same kind of accident, not the same kind of corruption. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have enough data or enough experience to say that Nigerians are going to come out of COVID-19 behaving better. When I say Nigerians, I mean Nigerians as a population and Nigerians as a government. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, I don't know if Forget Man is there. I can't agree with him, though. Yeah. I can't agree with him just thinking about, you know, most of the things that have happened in the past and how we don't even change anything. So I can't agree with him with, when it comes to that. I just, I just, I just think also that, you know, um, there's, the fact that it's affecting most of the leaders, it's now going to be a must for them to want to put structures in place. You get what I'm saying? Because it's something, it's, it, it, it's different when it's, it, it's affecting just a particular kind of people, a particular set of people, and, and so people are exempted, yeah. from, exempted from, from, what, from, the, from the repercussions. But the fact that it's affecting, yeah. you know, leadership and it's affecting everybody, and nobody is, you know, not 
be able to, 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 to have this disease, disease, it will force them to put structures in place. Like I always say, um, if we wanted the educational system to work in Nigeria, we should put a law that states that all you know, um, office holder, whoever wants to run for office, must have their kids go through Nigerian schools. Must. If you, don't, if you know you're not going to do that, don't do it. Don't, don't run for office. If we do that, they're going to fix it. They're I think I have to agree with you on that so one. Now that it's affected the yeah. I yeah. think they're going to put measures in place. Yeah, I wasn't right, that, thinking that, that, like I, I wasn't thinking I like actually you. Actually, appreciate your optimism <laughs> bias, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not able to suffer from it because I know what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, that's optimism yeah. bias, and it makes sense. It's it's normal to 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 think like that. But I can assure you, just take a look at every other thing that has affected them. These guys want to travel out of the country. For the ones that don't have private jet, they have to go to Ethiopia or go to Dubai or go to some other country to connect. That has not affected them. They have one little headache or one medical issues. They have to go to London, to Germany, to India. That did not affect them. They pay hundreds of thousands of pounds and as a collective, billions of, of dollars to educate people abroad. There is nothing COVID-19 has done to our political class, to our elites that they've not dealt with before. The only difference is that there's the urgency. After COVID-19, that urgency will, will not be in place. So the only difference that COVID-19 brings to their lives is urgency. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, we have to, we have to stop that conversation there. Hey, hopefully we'll get to hear where your hope lies, Amodra. Okay, we're only just getting started. <laughs> After I'm that. Okay. I need to know where it's so blind. Don't worry, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. After the break, Bright says, no point taking more than you need. How much is that, I wonder? Saying it like it is sometimes seems alarmist when we are used to docking and diving. The future of life on Earth lies in the balance. Have you ever wondered what a balanced world will, will look like? A world where there are equal opportunities for all living things. The past few months has been a test of our lifetime, and the result has shown us that the most important things in life is not Gucci, Lamborghini, or trips to Miami, but our health, family, and environment. There's one thing I have personally learned. It is that we don't need so much to survive on Earth. I've learned that what we have is enough if everyone takes only what they need. I've never understood the concept of rich and poor, when some people have excess and most people don't have enough to survive. In Nigeria, 82.9 million people live below poverty line, earning 137,000 per year. Can you imagine that? 137,000 for a whole year. They live in the worst conditions and survive and struggle to survive. I remember my dad advising me to work hard so I don't end up poor. But I've grown up to see that it's not about how hard you work. Life has not given us equal opportunities. There are lots of people who are more talented, smarter, and work 10 times harder, but are still not able to meet their day essential needs. I saw a video of a woman selling banana who was asked to stay home. And she said, I can't stay home. I have seven children, and I can't bear to hear them cry for food. I have to find a way. This is one out of millions of Nigerians who are highly affected by the pandemic. So as we transcend into this new norm, we should work towards creating a balance. For those who have more than enough, see it as a responsibility to enforce balance by creating opportunities for those who do not have it. Don't ever think for a second that you are better than the next person because you supposedly worked harder and end your position. Rather, see it as a favor from God and a responsibility to create opportunities for others who are not privileged to be in your position. I'd like to end with a story of a man I look up to. His name, LeBron James. In 2018, he earned $35 million from his NBA contract. And that same year, he donated $51 million for a school project in his community, giving kids free education, food, and employing their parents. There's enough for all of us. Take what you need and pass it on. Because if everyone takes only what they need, 
there will be enough to go around. This is how we create a balanced world, and it's what the future requires from us. I don't know if I should speak up first or wait for others to, to speak their piece. I like the delivery, um, but I, my, my reservations are really in that it speaks to what, what comes to mind when I hear what you're saying. It's not because the ideals you're espousing aren't laudable, but it makes me think of communism. You know, we've been down that road before. When you say take only what you need, who is to determine how much you need? My needs are different to yours. And, who is, and once you start getting to those relative things, and you know, then there's also the issue of taking away the yeah. motivation for competition, genuine competition, because there's the welfare state. I get that, because you can't neglect the poor and expect to thrive as a nation. But the minute you start taking away the incentive and you say, oh, no matter what I do, um, I should only take what I need. Uh, then, you know, mm -hmm. it's a bit like what they're doing in, under the federal system now. The states, no matter what they do, they go and collect from the center. There has to be some, as far as I'm concerned, some motivation to run the extra mile. That's where capitalism comes in. But to temper that, I think probably what I would look to is more of a welfare state, one that doesn't let anyone be left behind. But as for take only what you need, mm, I'm not sure how that works out in practice. I, I, think, I think what, what I'm saying is more like what, you're, what you just described. Yeah. I think it doesn't have to be, you know, you're just taking exactly like when it comes to like particular things. It's more like if you're in a position where you have more than enough, you should create infrastructures that help others have at least enough. You get what I'm saying? So, for example, one of the, one of the, when I think about it, when you go to the East, you have a lot of rich, you know, billionaires, businessmen. But if you look at the state of the environment, it is, it is, it is not, not, not something to write on my Like, you have a lot of really poor people. Now, I'm not saying go and give them money. I'm saying create an environment that will enable them at yeah. least get enough for their family. Yeah. That's, what, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, I get you. Can I, I get you. Can I, can, I say, can I say something? Please say. Yes, um, I, I like the, the what you ended it with, the story of the man you look up to so much, the Brand James. That he looks uh, like, but, he looks yeah. like him. <laughs> you know, but what you need to really factor into this case is the, the, uh, both countries. Now, he donated how many millions, you know, into the school project. Now, the people, he is okay, he's working, his community is okay. His uh, the, the the system he lives in is okay. It's being handled by people, whether they're stealing money or not, they are still doing their jobs. You understand? So he put in the money and the money was used for what it was meant for. That's mm. their system. Now bring it back to our own system. Are we okay? The people he is you're gonna give that much money to, are they okay enough? to utilize it for what it's meant for, e.g., what is happening right now. A lot of companies have come up donating billions to fight COVID-19. Mm. We're just hearing about it. We are practically not seeing anything. Mm. It got to a stage where, yeah. you know, it got to a stage where the accountant general was asked how far, how much has come in, how is it being spent, and the next day, his office burned down. <laughs> just his wow. office. Yeah. Yeah, that's so basically really now you can't account for how much was has been collected and has been lost. Oh, wow. And is there no, anybody think, talking think, about I it? Think, no. I'm sorry. You understand? So you need There's to a bit of what misinformation. Okay. There's a bit of misinformation. Okay. The okay. money, the money that was donated by private organizations is under CAR COVID. CAR COVID and it's managed oh, okay. by the same private organization. Okay. So okay, whatever then. God bonds in that government building has nothing to do with CAR COVID. And okay, so it has videos has, of Dangote, Herbert Wigwe saying they are doing this and they are doing that. Um, I don't know how much. And then the other side of it is a lot of we in Nigeria people announce donations and the difference between the announcements and actually and making the bring is where the problem is. <laughs> but I know for sure that the private donations are not being housed by government. It's it's being yeah. housed and being managed by CACOVI. Okay. So, yeah. But what basically what I'm trying to say is the countries are different. Their systems are different. Some ours here we are almost always all the time not transparent. So people always have to do guesswork. Rumors have to start before different people start to come up to try and defend this or defend that. Okay. You understand? Okay. That's just what I'm trying to say. Okay. Nafisa, I you wish were... there would be enough transparency. Uh, okay. Yeah, Nafisa was 
agreeing. I, I wasn't sure if she was agreeing with. Oh, no, I was agreeing with you. I, I totally, it was a very nice presentation as well. But to be honest, I see um, it, the implementation is where it becomes positive to me because to be honest, it seems more of um, a mindset revolution more than any other thing. Okay. Because to be honest, I'll start because take for example in my house. Now, I have an uncle. He says, you know what? I just want to get enough to feed my family, to send my children to the best school. And when I'm done with that, I owe no responsibility to anyone else. That's the mindset of the average Nigerian. It's a survival mentality. Mm. I just want to do what I need to do to get by, and then the rest of it can go into hell. Because of the kind of society we live in, nothing like, exactly. look, look at this entire thing, look at the entire pandemic. To be honest, do I think that Nigeria will change after this pandemic? I'm not so sure. I wow. can choose to be optimistic. <laughs> Do you understand? Mm. But I think yeah, I can choose to be optimistic, and I choose to be optimistic. But whether we're going to, whether there's going to be one monumental. Do you know what I think this pandemic is? I think you know how they say little drops of water make a mighty ocean. I think it's a drop. I think it's a very big drop. But I think it's a drop. So we need several That's COVIDs fine. to get to the mighty ocean. We have to wrap this well, segment up. <laughs> Sorry, um, the time is out on this one. Well, we continue projecting in the interest of building a better society. Nafisa is up next as she points us to our destiny. Some might say it's long awaited after the break. The word restructuring has become quite popular in recent times. However, two things we must bear in mind when we examine this concept are devolution of power, political decentralization, and fiscal federalism. That is a differential economic model. It is no secret that we largely practice a unitary system of government, which does not suit the large um, and diverse nature of our country. The system places an inordinate amount of power on the central government, making the states and local governments very weak. A true federal system of government is one that divides the power between the national government, states, and local governments. The United States is a prime example of how a federal government system operates. The states in the U.S. are powerful enough that they can negotiate international trade deals with other countries as long as they do not clash with the interests of the U.S. government. The truth is that whoever tries to hold back or suppress calls for restructuring in Nigeria is simply delaying the inevitable. Nigeria is not working. Oil in its crude form is the mainstay of our economy. Our refineries are not functioning at full capacity at all. After nearly 60 years of independence and discovery of oil in commercial quantity, we still import finished product from other oil-producing countries such as Niger Republic. And, and, and given the onset of this worldwide pandemic, the price of oil is drastically reducing. I think it's about $10 per, per barrel now. That's how much it's selling. And we're really hardly selling any at all. Resource control has also been a thorny issue in the national discourse. The issue has given rise to insurgencies, especially in the Niger Delta, with the militants, and the fact that various states have been reduced to federal allocations, everyone has diminished their abilities to create their own indigenous wealth, apart from oil, and make their states economically viable. We need to understand that as a people, the cost of not restructuring far at least the cost of restructuring in these present times. However, what matters the most is that we restructure peaceably. I, I completely agree with Nafisa. I think Nigeria has to restructure or be doomed. There is no question about it. Okay. And it has to start, in my opinion, with the essence of federalism. Nigeria is a federal republic, but primarily only on paper. In the real sense of it, we are far from federal. And I think for Nigeria to thrive, we must build a system where a system that is competitive, where each state can aspire to anything, whether to wealth, whether to education, whether to industrial mm -hmm. development, whatever you can imagine. And where, they can, where the state can drive one another in, in, in a direction that, that, is de, that is development. What we have right now is a guarantee from the center that no matter how incompetent your state is, no matter how unmotivated your, governors are, your, your, your government is for each of these subnational systems, you will still get something from the center. I do not think mm -hmm. that would help us as a country. I don't think that mm -hmm. the world has thrived on people depending on a particular system. America practices the federal system of government. But what, what happens is that they actually do it in the real sense of it. Each state can move in a certain direction. 
tax, taxes are not the same thing. Some laws on some of the most important issues in the world are not the same thing, but there are federal laws too. So mm. I think I completely agree with Nafisa. Nigeria has to find a way to restructure, and we don't have to do too much. We already claim to be a federal republic. We just have to live true to the name now. Okay, um, Omodri, I just want to agree with you, but to say that I'm, I'm not sure anymore that that's enough. In the sense that I think uh, maybe it's through the years, we, so people have managed to poison the minds of people such that tribalism yeah. and all these, this, the vacuum of you know, true ideologies has seeped in. So people are now dealing with who is on my side or the superficial appearance of who is on my side. Yeah. So in, in as much as you restructure, if that feeling of distrust and those false sentiments are still at play, they will still twist. After all, we adopted the American system and managed to corrupt it. So what you need is to do mm -hmm. a, a, a you know, um, parallel, in, do you call it indoctrination now, where people get to realize that their value is not in their tribe or their religion so much as it is in being a human being. And if you have a fellow human being who is doing the right thing, then he's your brother. Something along those lines. Okay, I agree with you on that one, right? But I'm a very, very practical person. I am not going to depend on each. We have 200 million people, as we claim. I'm not going to depend on the morality and the sense of value of these people. I'd rather depend on the system. I, I depend on laws. I depend on policy to guide people in a certain direction. And then what yeah. I would do is provide the capability and the opportunities and the motivation for them to do the right thing. But I'm sorry, I'm not going to trust that people are just going to develop a sense of value that says it's not about tribalism, it's not about ethnicity. No, that's why I said because, hand, a concurrence ha, a side but, by side, but, you know. But go ahead. Yeah. What, 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 now, what now happens? What now happens? Omojua, what now happens when the system is corrupt? When the system is already messed up? When the system is has been fashioned in a way that it only benefits negative people who don't have, you know, who don't have the interest of the country at heart? Systems you know, are designed, rather, right? I, I know. I'd rather, I'd rather we aim to get people who are qualified in mm. certain positions to make decisions. People who are qualified, trust me, already you will know their mindset. Their mindset, their state of mind, their mindset is different from you know being tribalistic or looking for loyalists and things. People who are qualified for positions actually worked to get there. Systems like, make people like, who are qualified get to those systems. That's the, that's the know, issue. We, uh, well, to get now, people who are qualified for that one, to build the for system that, for them to get there. Okay, we which know, comes we, first? What I'm trying, to, what I'm trying to say is, yeah. Hmm. What? Which, what? I said, which to, comes first? What I'm the chicken or the egg? What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, for you to go through school, yes, to read, study a course and, and get your uh, um, certificate, you've been, through, you've been through the process. You understand? There's a difference with that man or woman being in a position to make decisions. There's a difference between that man and somebody who is put in that position out of favor of being a loyalist to somebody. Okay, not you understand? Not so that's I what I mean. To. And that's how they will work with the system and, you know, restructure the system in a way that it now starts to work how it's meant to work. Okay, now, Fisa, okay. I don't know if I'm I, I, I just sense. want to chip in. Yeah. I just want to chip in. So, um, like, I mean, to say very funny story, short, very funny story. So a couple, like a week ago, I made this tweet out on Twitter about restructuring and President Buhari in the same sentence. And oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I didn't sleep. <laughs> Thought I didn't sleep. I saw all manners mm. of insults, <laughs> insulting me, insulting themselves, insulting everybody, insult, insult, they insulted everything mm. under the sun. You know, it was just, it was, it wasn't funny, but it was very enlightening to see the mindset, perspective of different people about the world restructuring. Because it's obvious that a lot, a lot of people have very different interpretations of what it means. Someone said, eh, if you restructure it, is it going to be for us? Can we trust these people? All those sorts of things. I think there needs to be a mass awareness about what it really means for our own individual um, particular for our own particular system not as it is not a broad definition not a broad spectrum but as it is and in my script i was going to talk about devolution of power and physical federalism because those i think are the two most important things that when it comes to restructuring nigeria that we oh, have sorry, to take we, it we're out of time and would, i wanted to hear what bright had to say bright try and sneak it in on the next on the next segment <laughs> Okay. okay. Some might say Nafisa speaks the mind of the people. What's your mind?
This is where you speak up concerning last week's edition. Simeon B exclaims, no social distancing in the studio. Simeon, apologies. We overestimated the distance between us. Your observation is noted. Whereas Keep Your Essence says, share to the diaspora. Thanks, Keep Your Essence. We push our content as far as we can. Kindly help by sharing and spreading the word. The debate continues on the foreign versus traditional gods. Lawrence Ndam says, it's not religion that's the problem in Nigeria. The government is the problem. We need to know our citizens. Whereas Akinyele Jones says, in Europe, only old people go to church. Here, youth don't go to church or worship any religion. My wife is an Italian woman. None of her family have a Bible at home. Christianity is a scam. Hmm. Each to their own, I guess, Akinyele. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Rugged Man steps up to the plate. We move. Progress is a measure of moving from one stage of achievement to another. Otherwise, it's just movement. Let's not kid ourselves. The immunity clause under Section 308 of the 1999 Nigerian Constitution has provided for the immunity of the president, vice president, governors, and their deputies. For the most part, the government for this clause is archaic. Having been embraced from earlier constitutions instituted by the then colonial British Empire. Unfortunately, <laughs> this course inadvertently allows government officials to abuse their offices, knowing fully well that they are protected by the same constitution. Some even brazenly commit criminal acts, e.g., sex or slapping senator. Too much powers are vested in Nigerian government officials. In Nigeria, the doctrine of separation of powers and checks and balances seems lost. We need strong institutions to ensure democracy. The office of the citizen must carry weight. That I'm serious about. Some officials openly use state resources to fund their expensive lifestyles and indulgences to the detriment of the very same people who elected them into office. Even worse <laughs> is the reality that accountability is lacking in most cases and ridiculous amounts of money are allocated to cater to the needs of these officials. Checking all of this, my question is, does this clause serve the greater good? The answer is a resounding no. So it is high time we level the field of prosecution. We must be able to immediately hold leaders to account not wait until after four years, not wait until they've had time to steal enough money to buy judges and lawyers or flee the country before, um, but, but, but now, now, now. We must institute and enforce penalties for officials who defy rules. Let me, let me restrain myself from commenting. I'll let someone else throw their weight in. Okay, <laughs> I'd like to say that the obvious populist position to take on the immunity clause is to say remove it because that's it makes sense it's, it's mm -hmm. it sounds very popular but the question i'd also like to ask is after these governors and these presidents that enjoyed the immunity clause after they leave office how many of them have we convicted on one side i'm asking that question and it's a rhetoric question on one side i'm asking Without the immunity clause, how many of them have you con convicted? And secondly, exactly. what kind of system are we going to have with a political system as petty, as parochial, and as inchoate as ours, where people yeah. take advantage of every role? What kind of system are we going to have if it was possible for people to actually sue their governors? I imagine a situation where a governor would be dealing with a case at least every other month. So it sounds like a good idea. I really do think it might be a good idea. But I think we need to find a way to say maybe certain issues, maybe certain criminal issues. Maybe we don't have a blanket removal. I think it's something to think about because when you actually look at even the criminal issues that these people were involved in, we find it very, very difficult getting conviction. Wow. I, um, let me just chip in here. 
Um, first of all, I agree with um, Omojua. I also agree with Rocket Man. I understand where he's coming from. But I think um, the rationale behind creating an immunity clause in the first place was so that um, public officials would concentrate on doing what they needed to do their jobs without um, having the constant distraction of prosecution cases every single day, every single week, every single time at every point. So while I do agree on Mojua that there should be a more balanced way or system or procedure or infrastructure put in place that would allow public officials remain accountable or without distracting them from doing what they need to do, the core of what they need to do. So that's my take on Let me, Natisa, let me say something. You say yes, um, the, the, the immunity clause was put there partly so that the government officials will be able to concentrate and not be distracted by um, cases every day, every day, every day. When you put it like that, that means you're, you actually are saying that they are committing crimes every day, every day, <laughs> every day, because it means they're being sued every day, every day, every no, day. Allegations. So now, no, let, no, me, no. Let, allegations. Me, let me ask this question this way. Let me ask this okay. question this way. If you, hire, if you hire somebody to work for you and the person mm -hmm. steals your money, what do you mm -hmm. do to the person? Of course, you take them to court. Thank you. Will you trust that person? Especially no, if it happens like twice. Thank you. So why do we even think of hesitating to prosecute somebody we put in a position to handle funds that's for the whole nation? Why do we even hesitate? Aren't we? This is where we're supposed to lead by example. You understand? Mm -hmm. And like Omojua said, uh, well, from what Omojua said, we shouldn't have a, do a blanket removal. Bros. Yeah. You cannot say this sin, this crime is bigger than this crime. No, I believe every crime is a crime, and anybody who commits it. Sorry, rugged time. man. Rugged Let's man. Let's lead by example. Yeah, I, why? Yeah. I, why I, I really I have to say something at this point is because I think again, whenever we look at these issues, we, we're brought back to the roots cause and, and the decays mm -hmm. from the root. The fact that we have government officials who fundamentally we have no confidence in you know, who operate like thugs, already tells you something. I mean, when I look at things like the fact that um, the American government are returning Abacha's loot with the condition that they must supervise, and we're all happy. Please, I beg, supervise them, because we don't trust them. You're already dealing with a, you know rot, a rot that has gone you know so you, deep that immunity yeah. clause is just another manifestation of the problem we're facing. We, you we're know just why, basically you saying, know, you know why it looks are not like the right happy. people for the you, job. Do you know why it looks like we're happy to collect the money and, and listen to whatever... Um, instructions they're given because the people who they're returning the money to have no intentions of using the money for the nation it's mm -hmm. like saying i want to give you this that's money what i'm trying now. to say that the candidates it's like, it's the like people saying, are calling, like, calling government like i want to give you this money now all i have in my head is oh, i shall bring the money just bring the money but whatever well, guys, they say guys, they're not listening guys, guys I will, I will, they're not listening i don't i don't what i don't really understand is how whenever we talk about you know politicians and leadership we kind of exempt ourselves out of it. <laughs> Because for me, for me, it's like these guys will not get there if we didn't put them there in the first place. They, they will, they will, they will, right? But you know they will. You know no, they, they have will. been. No, no, you let know, me tell know you they have you. been, and you know no, they will. See, let's no, be very will. realistic yeah. with each other. Let's be no, very realistic with each other, right? No, that's, you, that's, how many, how many ballot box snatching videos did you see during the election? Okay. But okay. I think. I mean, no, 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 no. What I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is, the people. Remember what I said that we should not wait until after four years to remove someone who's who we have evidence against as in a, uh, committing a crime. You know why? Yeah. Because by the time it's two, three, four, boss, do you know how much money I can gather for myself for four saying, years? And now saying, I will use that to saying, buy any type of protection there is, including saying, people. I get what you're saying. You said that, but, but are you saying? Are you saying now that the people have no role, and we can never have a role when it comes to the, the, the leadership of our system, we, of our government? That's. We, of course, course, now, of now you're saying, you're sorry, saying sorry we're out of time. Bryce, no, no, can you I land your point in a sentence? Because we're about to wrap okay, this segment land up. You, land, your, land your point yeah, in a sentence. I feel, I, feel, I feel like it's both ways. We should always understand that we, we, we have the lead, we deserve the leaders that we have. And okay. if we want to change the system, it starts with us 
choosing the right leadership. But in not necessarily ways, via the ballot box. Okay, okay. Right, we, we, have to, we, have to, we have to leave it there. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. We'll have right. to find a way to continue that conversation. Certainly, we okay. are making progress by any measure. We're already on our final lap, and it feels like things only just got warmed up. That's The Advocate for you, JJ Omojua, after this break. When you say it out loud, it seems like you're being original, when in reality, many may be thinking about it, but just not saying it. Nigeria and its all rich mate, a poor country pretending to be rich. Nigeria throws its weight around primarily based on the size of its population and the myth that it is all rich. Take the all rich side of the story. It can't be difficult to figure out why it was a myth all along. A family can earn one million per month and still live from hand to mouth if it's made up of one husband, three wives, and 16 children. That's because wealth is as much about what you earn as it is about how you spend it. Most of Nigeria's oil revenue gets stolen. But even if that wasn't the case, if we shared the income per citizen without accounting for taxes or even production sharing agreements, the best the average citizen would get is four barrels per year. And that's in a given year, say during an oil boom, and oil was selling for $100 per barrel. That means the average citizen could end up with $400 per year. But when you take away the payments to the joint venture partners and you factor in the taxes, even during an oil boom, you'd be lucky to get $250 per year as a citizen. On today's numbers, with low production and extremely low oil prices, the average citizen would be lucky to go home with $50 every year. Nigeria would truly be oil rich if we had a population of, say, 20 million people, but at 200 million people, we may be rich in oil, but we are not oil rich. That meat needs to die because it feeds the laziness and greed of our politicians and the self-entitlement of some of our citizens. And the same goes for the income from our other natural resources. Irrespective of what we get from them, we have 200 mouths chasing that and looking to feed from it. That is why Nigeria is really and truly a poor country as it is today. We are not poor because we are not earning a lot of money. We are poor because we are not earning enough for ourselves because of our population size. The way out of this is to develop our human capacity. A population of 50 million with a per capita income of $50,000 is a better market than ours with 200 million. The same way 250 is greater than 120 because our 200 million has a per, per capita income of $6,000 less, actually. It is time to prioritize the development of the men and women who work on Nigeria's soil because the oil and other resources beneath the soil will never be enough to prosper us all. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your advocacy because for me, it feels like we're ending on a positive note because I know. The previous ones, it, we're good at dissecting the problem. And even uh, Bright was beginning to say that uh, it's like we, we're divorcing ourselves from the problem. But now, you've come back to one of the topics I love the most, which is to invest in human capital. You know, so Because yeah. sometimes people look at uh, population as a curse. They keep saying we have too many people. I've always advocated that population will never be a curse if you invest in it. And once you do, then the exactly. real glory of Nigeria will come to the fore. So maybe, in a way, the real curse has been oil all along. And now that the oil has clearly been exposed to have relative value, we'll go back to the thing that has, you know, you say an eternal value, that's the human beings. And we have to, you know, basically put the horse before the cart. Am I alone? No, no, you're, you're not. not. Alone. I thought, uh, <laughs> you're almost no, right. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just really, I'm just really impressed um, on how you know you were able to come up with those numbers and okay. you broke it down to the, the barest minimum. And for me, you know, I've always felt like you know we have enough, and I still think that way because um, I mean we're, we're living in a, in a, in a, glo in a globalized and uh, digitalized system where our profit doesn't just come from within. Right, you have people doing business across the world. You have, you know, people investing money everywhere, and this money is like coming back in. And it still just boils down to my perspective of being able to. Um, I think one of the major points there was focusing on empowering, you know, humans, Nigerians. Because if you look at China, I was doing something on um, skills development, and I discovered that, you know, major, majorly China's economy is actually based on their, their, their human capital, how much money they make from just you know, 
investing in their skills and making money out of the fact that they are able to produce, you know, go to other countries, bring a lot of money back into the system. So if we're able to empower our young people mm -hmm. with the skills, especially in this digital age, skills like, you know, digital skills when it comes to artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, virtual reality, all these skills that, that people demand, even remotely, even without actually seeing you. If we're able to empower people with these skills, that's a lot of money coming in, mm -hmm. right? So imagine mm -hmm. we have... One, we have 2,500 people earning 1,175,000 1, in a month. Mm -hmm. Together, it's like 5.6 billion. That's how much money will come in in a year from just 2,500 people earning 1,175,000 1, in a month. So imagine if we have young people who are making that much money, 200,000, 250,000 in a month, times you know the amount of young people that we have, even if, we have, even if it's 50%, because they have the skills. That's, a, that's way more than what Oya will bring in. So I, I'm really 100% with you with investing in human capital. Hmm. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm, also, I'm also happy. OK, no, Nafisa, go, ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> Such a gentleman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say that out of this pandemic, two things that we should probably take out of, or at least one very important thing that we should probably take out of is education. Education and healthcare, two, okay. things, two strong things. Education, development of our human capital, and our healthcare system that, you know, it's this um, COVID-19 just really exposed how terrible the system is and how we are basically struggling to meet up. But like J um, JJ Mojua said, I do totally agree with him that we need to invest in the men and women that we have in this country. Our population doesn't have to be a course. It can be a huge a Huge, 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 huge blessing. Yes. Only if you know how to use it well and invest in it. Because with education, you can literally do anything. Not just formal education. Mm -hmm. Like Bright said, skills development, virtual reality, technology, data. The fourth industrial dev um, revolution was all in from the World Economic Forum was all about data and how it is going to frame the world in which we are going into. But you know, Nigeria, Nigeria didn't take it seriously. They were just a stakeholder. Sorry, they were just a spectator. Mm -hmm. But now I hope that we, this is something that we can take seriously, education and healthcare. Okay, before Rugged Man speaks, speaks. Rugged Man, I want, I, to, I want to ask. What I, what I, wanted, I, what I wanted to say, okay, what I wanted to say, well, yeah. part, was part of what she just said. Maybe I shouldn't have let you speak. It's not just <laughs> it's still, not. Your, still your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but I was going to start with, right, I'm happy you said, um, you said he, you were surprised at how he came up with the numbers. You know why? I was gonna, That's how I was going to start. I'm happy, you said you're happy he came up with the numbers. It's because Amadua is educated. That was how I wanted to start. Because <laughs> if you have a nation that the people, half of the people or more than half are illiterate, they cannot, even if they see an opportunity, they will most likely not even know what it is. They won't even know how no. to apply themselves to it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So education yeah. is key. Education is key. From my field, now see all the things that Bright broke down. From my field, which is entertainment, I can authoritatively tell you there was a research that was done a year ago. Piracy alone takes 15 trillion a year. Nigerian entertainment, both um, um, video, audio, um, authors and magazines, fashion, they will lose 17 trillion a year to piracy. And we've been trying to get the government to come join us and fight this so that we can plug all those holes. How much is the Nigerian budget? To now imagine them getting, the, getting all the taxes and that and stuff from seven, some 15 trillion a year. And well, that's just from entertainment. Believe it or not, we're now, out of time already. I, I, I scarcely believe it but myself. But we always have to have time. <laughs> we have to come back again and, and do some. But, but, but do some sorry, dancing. let me just end with this. Let okay. me just end with this. Okay. Thank God I'm talking about, we're talking education. And yeah. thank God I said, I talked earlier about having people in a pos in position to make decisions who are literate, who are educated, who are mm -hmm. qualified. That way, I can authority. The only thing I can ask, tell you is, a man cannot give you what he does not have. Okay. Okay. We'll have to stop there. Well, even I look forward to this edition. Sport for choice is how I'd term it, wouldn't you? Keep watching The Advocate on Plus TV Africa to stay in the picture with those big conversations. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. 
don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Our voices and your voice is all it takes. So together, let's keep advocating for a better society. Till next time, it's bye for now. Yeah, Hi. happy families. <laughs>、mm. that to change Nigeria, we have to put the system in place to make stealing difficult, to make accountability、yeah. and transparency the norm. The other day, my WhatsApp group raised about seven million naira or thereabout. We donated. We gave the money to a young person. We gave the resources to a young person to go and donate. He went to donate in his own name. Wow. <laughs> And this is not abnormal in the reality of Nigeria. Okay, now, and now let me see. You know what happened Amadua, all over、um, the place. Amadua, Amadua, now, you know the mistake you guys make. You know the mistake you make. You know the mistake you make. Why not? Why didn't somebody else? Why not you? At least I know so I can't point, trust so that's you. Not the, so I'm not talking. Forget、why、about the mistake we made. The major thing you need to check is those schools you said that happened from 62 to Abacha's time. The motive. Mm. What we are looking for now is different from what inspired their coup. They just want their power. Roger,、so、they are idealistic, and that's a good thing. Yeah, idealistic. No, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. See, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned they had the good motives like you. Kaduna, Kaduna was a good person like you. They were young people like us that actually believed that they could do much better, and that's the truth. And, the, and then what happened? The thieves in the system. Power happened. Power happened. Brother, so, but so basically, what we are saying right now, realistically, what we are saying to each other right now is that there's no hope. I agree with restructuring that Nafisa said. With restructuring,、mm. each state can now begin to focus on their strengths, because what we now、exactly. have is one, one, one system in Abuja trying to create one earthquake and hoping that that earthquake will have impact across the country. I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. But if we have 37 earthquakes at the same time. Yes,、yeah, so. this is the way I see restructuring. Thirty-seven、yeah. earthquakes at the same time. Even if some people's earthquake is is very low, is not having any effect. At least they are guaranteed. Twenty of them are going to be impactful, and then we can now grow together. This whole police issue now, yeah, I'm practically the Nigerian police customer care. As in, I get more calls than the police. As in, it's gotten so crazy that before even the police know about anything, I know about it. Then I now inform them. Yeah. It got、oh, so crazy.、Wow. Some, someone called me from Abuja, kidnap case. I said, "Madam, call police. Why are you calling me? They kidnap your brother. You are calling me. Call <laughs> 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 police. How can you deal with that, though, man? That's that,、uh, that's crazy, man. I don't. I know it's crazy, bro. I stopped counting at when、yeah. it got to over seven hundred people had helped. I stopped counting when it got to seven hundred over seven hundred. I just stopped counting. And I, today, 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 we're on one issue. There's an 18-year-old girl that was raped by five boys, and they're trying to choose the whole issue. As in, bro, you do not want to know what I've I've been feeling like a politician in power for the past three years because the things I've heard,、nah. the things I've seen,、nah. my brother, you do not want to know. Thank you, guys. It's nice less than one、Chai. minute. So,、uh, nice to meet you all. Nafisa, nice to meet、Thank、you. Nice to meet you. 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 Plus TV, please edit my face well. Let it be fine. I know I'm ugly. <laughs> Try, please help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye, guys. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely. And let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when、yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organisation should be above the law, and I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do. If the system is already corrupted, we've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.